So my father, like many who built this country, was an immigrant from the Middle East in the 1970s. To make ends meet, he had to have two jobs, so he'd get up before we were up at the dusk and uh, start his first job and then come home sometime after 11 p.m. after his second job, and we were allowed to stay up because otherwise we wouldn't see our father, me and my sister and brother, uh, and wait for him, and we had a routine at about 11 p.m. He'd come home, we'd give him his dinner for the day, and then uh, probably two or three times a week after a particularly punishing day beneath cars, he was a diesel mechanic, he would then lay on the floor, take off his shirt, uh, and we would fight for who got the opportunity to stomp all over his back to work out all the kinks and the bugs and the pains. And, and this is what uh, his back looked like. And you, you might see these scars and these notches. His entire back is full of these gouges. And you know when you're a kid, I'm like six, and you see someone with a scar, you're like, Ugh! it's like so. So imagine as a child seeing that on your father. And no matter how many times I'd ask, I'd have to keep having him remind me the story of how that happened. He was a child in the 40s. He had fevers all the time. And uh, back then, you know, when he got a fever, his mother would take out the razor blade and slit his back so the blood could come out because the paradigm at the time was that the bad thing causing the infection is in the blood and you just got to get it out so their body could grow new blood. That's called bloodletting. Uh, and I'd be freaked out. Like, I couldn't imagine what mother would do this to her kid. And even now as a mother, I just, you know, but that was the paradigm of the time. And I'm, I'm convinced that that's when I started kind of my purpose in life, which is really in the day to tackle messy, complex, wicked, intractable problems that make no sense and bust apart the status quo. Uh, and it just ended up that that ended up being in the field of healthcare, and that's you know solving wicked problems on steroids, and that's what I do for a living as a health futurist. So, so I'm here to talk to you about the future of health. It is going through a fundamental shift. It will look nothing like what we know it is today, and that's because healthcare, unlike uh, any if not all other sectors of society, has not yet materialized from all the advances in the modern digital age. So you might be thinking, well, you know, these healthcare people, maybe they just don't know, they're too academic. No, it's not like we're not aware of, you know, what advances in the communication have done to transform every other part of society. In fact, you know, we can go back to the early 20s, I think were the first records where you know, when radio communication was a, a new way of communicating, futurists could picture a world like this of radio medicine, right? Where a doctor and a patient didn't have to be in the same place at the same time to communicate. And then a few decades later, when TV screens were the dominant technology in everyone's households, the Jetsons normalized this concept of telemedicine. I'm not sure why there's a cover on the doctor's mouth in the picture, but whatevs. Um, yet 60 years later, the dominant way in most of the world that you or I have an interaction with a clinical expert is still the in-person visit, right? We knew it was coming, but it hasn't happened. And that's because healthcare as we have it today uh, was built on, you know, some basic ingredients. Buildings and clinics, uh, people, doctors, nurses, pens, papers, and fax machines. Okay, so for the children, a fax machine stands for facsimile. It's this like box that takes printed pages and digitizes them through a phone line. Healthcare's the only industry using it still. And so all these elements, right, bricks and people and paper and fax machines and, uh, and pens are analog, right? What, what does analog do? Analog constrains you on time, distance, space, and labor. It, it doesn't allow you to take the friction out of all the different communications and touch points and transactions you need to have with all the people around you to live and let alone to be healthy. And that hasn't changed in 150 years. 
So now we all know what today's healthcare system feels like, and I'm just going to walk you through a typical encounter, and this actually happened to me not that long ago. So I woke up one day with a, a, a weird growth on the back of my neck, and I'm in healthcare, so I don't freak out over things very easily, but I had an aunt who died very young of brain cancer, and a lot of these things are genetic, and so that was kind of going through the back of my mind. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I kind of let it go. I work, you know, th I have three kids. I work full time. I travel. I, I couldn't deal with the healthcare system right now. A uh, couple days, it's getting bigger. It's starting to hurt. It's hard. And so where do I go? Dr. Google freaks me out. It's like, I don't even know what it said I had. So, so I finally caved and did the dreaded call the doctor's office to make an appointment. Uh, so, you know, a few back and forths on voicemail, and finally, you know, the dance starts. So I get the appointment, and uh, the doc uh, says two weeks. So I'm like, okay, take the day off work, drive, park, pay $20 to park, wait an hour and a half in the waiting room, even though we agreed on the appointment time, uh, only for the doc to say, I don't know what it is. So then writes a prescription for a topical just in case and then proceeds to fax the referral <laughs> to a specialist to see what's going on. She gets the referral, I don't know, two days later. Her office sends a letter in the mail to me to tell me my appointment is in six weeks at this date and this time. And I have no choice. And now this thing is getting nasty in the back of my head. And so I'm like, all right, so six weeks later, get to the appointment, she doesn't know what it is. So says, we need to take a biopsy. She does it, thankfully, in the office. So that goes to pathology. They send her a fax with the results. Her office calls me, won't tell me the results because I have to come to an appointment in two weeks where I have to take a day off work, drive, park $30 this time because it's now in a hospital for her to tell me, it's not cancer, it's just an infection. Here's your prescription, right? That was about 85 days of me not knowing what's going on, of using all these resources of the healthcare system while other people wait in line or don't have. And that's when it takes me back to that six-year-old kid having a like, what the healthcare experience? <laughs> and now I'm on because I'm out to stop, you know, complex problems. So then I think, imagine if in the rest of our living life, we had to have this kind of experience, right? So I counted this morning, I have done 45 texts, emails, I've done a conference call, two video conference calls between my family and my work life, and it's like half you know, way through the day, right? If this was a healthcare paradigm, for any one of those interactions, I would have had to write a letter mail it and tell that person when we're gonna have an appointment, then we'd have the appointment and that was a transaction, right? Business and society would grind to a halt. This weekend is my daughter's birthday. I have to, Saturday I gotta get pizza and cake. If this was the healthcare system, I would have had to take time out of work, go to the bank during their hours, nine to four, never on Fridays, of course, me to tell her, get the exact cash I need for this weekend so I could then go make the purchase. Our entire patterns of consumption and commerce would be nothing like they are today, right? And then I'm thinking about my other kid as a book report due next week. We would have had to take Saturday off, go to the library, speak to the librarian and tell her or him what we're looking for, he or she would bring us some books and some magazines. We need a lot of change to put change in the photocopy machine to get the stuff. And then he would have to handwrite or type and get it right the first time, <laughs> his report, and then hand it in, right? Our access to education wouldn't be nothing like it is today. Yet that's what the healthcare experience continues to be today. And I tell you, we now know that no matter what budget we have, we will never have the number of doctors, nurses, buildings, hospital beds, pills, to meet the demand of our population, which is growing and staying alive a lot longer than when we designed healthcare 150 years ago, because people are staying alive long with multiple diseases. It's just not gonna be possible. So then I think about my six-year-old self, and I'm actually positive 
because just like bloodletting is no longer the paradigm, uh, this paradigm of this analog system is starting to go away. So I'm a futurist. I spend all my time in the future, and I'm now going to kind of walk you through what it's going to start looking like very soon. A couple of these examples are actually in the market right now. They're just not the dominant paradigm, and they're certainly not really available wide scale in Canada. So in the future, which is you know here now, I would just take a picture of the thing, and then my health system would just allow me to you know text it or upload it. An AI, artificial intelligence kind of algorithm behind the scenes would compare this image to, I don't know, 10,000, a million, a hundred million, like it, and triangulate that data with my genetics, my background, my age, my family history, and decide with pinpoint accuracy uh, what it thinks is going on, suggest that to a doctor or a nurse, uh, and that person would use their judgment to see whether they want to take a look and make a firmer diagnosis. So maybe they'd show up on a you know, face chat or something, or a hologram is possible now, hang out with me at the Starbucks. You know, and then I could show her it a little bit better, and she would confirm what the AI diagnosed, and then she would say, oh, there's a Rexall around the corner, go pick up your prescription, right? 15 minutes. Remember 85 days? Soon, I'm not going to go anywhere to pick up a prescription. A drone's going to deliver it to my house or wherever I am, right? And then very soon, and this is already in the market, I'm going to 3D print the drugs in my house, right? There goes the whole retail pharmacy industry. So that's kind of level one future already here. Level two. We're not going to wait till Zena has the symptoms. So imagine if this was the path of that thing growing behind my neck, getting worse, me kind of caving, <laughs> and then you know three months later, I get some conclusion. Um, the reality is, over all that time, I've produced a mountain of digital exhaust just by existing in the digital world. My texts, my emails, what did I search on Google? What cream did I buy at Walmart? What did I say to my mother on the phone about something in my head? All that can now be mined and crawled through by algorithms that would have suggested an action maybe four months earlier to prevent it from ever happening. Right? That's called predictalytics. We're moving to that model of medicine now to prevent ever needing the formal healthcare system. It changes the whole game. Now here's level three, this is crazy science, but not really, because it's here today. So there's these new tools, so there's this new tool called CRISPR. Think of them as molecular scissors, that if you've got a gene, so maybe my thing was caused by bad genes, it could have been a brain tumor, um, it, they could go in, even when I'm in my mommy's tummy, at an embryo, and snip out the bad gene, put it back together, and eliminate the disease from ever happening. We're already doing this with, with children who are born with lethal genetic diseases, right? So that's gene editing, molecular surgery. So most futurists predict in the future, right now the top killers in the world are things like cancer, cardiac disease, um, heart disease, right? Um, the number one killers will not be medical. They're going to be accidents and geopolitical, wars, and climate change. Right? This is where it's going. So the future of health is going through a fundamental shift. Uh, and just like bloodletting is no longer the paradigm, uh, you know, this experience won't be. So what does that mean for you? Well, it's got pretty big implications. You might not be thinking about because you don't work in healthcare like me, but on three levels. So first is as a user of the system, whether that's you, your family member, your friend, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, either if you haven't experienced it, it's coming, right? We do get sick and die, this is humans, at least for now. Some people think we're never gonna die, but whatever, that's a different talk. Um, you know, you have come to expect a level of personalization, intelligence, responsiveness, uh, smartness, like you have in everything else, and you're, you're gonna need that and expect that from healthcare. And when it doesn't offer it, you're gonna be pissed. The second level is as an employer or an employee. Healthy people do awesome things. And our big employers are not going to count on the healthcare system that hasn't changed in 150 years to keep their employees healthy. 
So they're taking things into their own hands, right? Amazon is building its own healthcare system for its employees right now. And then the third is really as a, as a citizen and a taxpayer. You all pay into this collective pot of money called health insurance. What does insurance do? You pay in now when you're healthy and working so that when you do get sick, it's there for you. And so it's becoming more and more important. So what do you do about it? You're probably thinking, I don't work in healthcare. I can't do this. It's too complicated. Well, I've got one task for you to do. Demand more. You're in control in a way you've never been before. The power is shifting to you. And my one message to you is, is use it. So just to give you a cue of what's starting to happen with, with people starting to kind of wake up and demand more, I had the pleasure of hearing the story of this young man a couple years ago. You might have read about him, Stephen Keating. So he was an MIT student uh, in the media lab doing a PhD in something really fancy with data. And he developed a tumor in his brain about the size of a baseball. And so he really wanted to understand what's going on with bi his biology and all this data. So he asked for all the images, the MRIs and the CT. And they proceeded to give him a stack of 30 CDs. OK, for the kids, a CD. It's a compact disk. It can hold about, I don't know, 50 gigabytes of data. And the only industry still using it to move data is healthcare. Um, so he got the data. He got genetically tested for himself. His clinical team didn't want it. He had to have 10 hour surgery. He had to be awake for the surgery so they would know they weren't kind of cutting bad things. He videotaped that thing and streamed it live for the whole world. He had the nurses holding uh, iPhones to do the audio. He opened up his data for the world's problem solvers to help him tackle his cancer. And it's a whole new phenomenon of patients being empowered with their, their data. So there he is after the surgery. So this is when I heard him speak. It was actually Remembrance Day. He had a Canadian poppy. But this was in San Diego. So through the images, never done before, it wasn't until he did it, that he reconstructed a 3D printout of his tumor in the red and his entire skull. And he would like walk around and show everybody, really internalizing. He ended up making Christmas ornaments of the tumor, OK? So, so don't leave her saying, Zaina said make salt and pepper shakers out of my tumor. No, no. I'm just saying, demand more. Uh, I am convinced. I work every day as a futurist and an innovator trying to modernize our health system, trying to guide our patients and our providers to the future. I'm convinced we are never going to be able to do it alone. We need a patient uprising. We need a consumer awakening. And so I'm inviting you to join me <laughs> to create the future of healthcare instead of protecting the past. Thanks.